When I started the business, I can truly admit that I didn't even know what a BAS bill was or how to pay my taxes. Just transitioning from on the tools to in the office has been such a big difference for me. This is not really my space, but I had to learn it. A lot of guys out there, when you end up in that scale side of your business, it's important to understand where your strengths lie, what you need to do in order to, I suppose, supplement that, who you need to find that can fill in those blanks. It take months and months of working with these, trying to get an opportunity quote on a job. You can always downscale, but upscaling really quickly is challenging. James, welcome to the Sideshow Podcast. Thank you. I'd like you to be here. Thank you. Hey, good to have you. Um, we're here today to talk about a one thing that I, I love discussing on the show and the audience typically resonates with. It's a bit of a success story. So um, before we jump in too much, do you want to give us a bit of a run through who you are, what you do, where you're from, you know, yep. all the social? Yeah, so um, my name's James Rolfe. Um, I'm the um, co-CEO of um, MR Roads, um, which is the logo you see behind us. Um, so it's um, I started um, I started the company about six years ago, um, a smaller company called Platinum Tippers, um, where I was still working um, for one of the one of the bigger road construction companies at the time. So I sort of went out on my own and took the leap. Um, and it wasn't until about about two years ago that I um, shacked up with my business partner Dan Micus, um, and that's when we really we, we really thought let's um, let's have a go here, and um, you know we can we can really make make a name for ourselves and, and disrupt the industry. Um, so that's that's when um, the whole MI Roads came about. We sort of we sort of merged two companies um, and had a bit of a rebrand and a and a and a new look and a new approach. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, in the last two years, it's been, um, it's been quite the journey. I think I've aged about 10 years, but, um, business is good. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, no, look, it's a, good, it's a, it's a, it's always great to hear or get people on the show, I suppose, that have sort of been through the journey. Uh, I mean, we get a lot of experts and stuff on the show, which teach stuff, but like, it's always nice to hear a story about how people have come to A to B. And I know in the, in the notes, when you, um, sent to through, earlier there was some really cool stuff on some like interesting ways that you've you know done things differently in order to get in front of your ideal customers and things like that so you know, yeah unpack some of those things uh, i know we talked a little bit sort of offline earlier about how um you know you're pretty much in that b2b sort of space so you yeah. know, thinking, what, what your ideal sort of all the clients that you typically work with are more in the um like council uh sort of air spaces yeah, definitely. So uh, at the moment, we're we're really in the interim from from your sort of mum and dad um, clients at home doing you know private residential driveways and things like that. We've moved into the, the 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 local government stuff with with councils and things like that. And we've we've literally we just had our final paving audit um, on Monday this week for our A two accreditation, which is which allows us to tender for um, our TMR and main road projects. Um, so that's that's literally going to open us up for a whole you know it's a whole different ball game so we're, we're, we're sort of right in the interim now with really um, a lot of council stuff a lot of, lot of local council and government um sort of schools car parks road widenings and things like that um but yeah there's there's definitely exciting times um to come that we're right on the brink of now um with with our a2 so with you when you and dan got together in the in the, in the initial stages were you both sort of in that residential space we were so so Dan and I um, met. We we actually worked for um, that company that I mentioned earlier. We Dan was more the corporate side of things, so he was in the office and I was out on the crew, driving the pavers. And um, he Dan always said to me that he um, he always admired me because um, I I used to drive a nicer car than the than the CEO of that company back in the day. So he he always said, you know, he always admired my drive, and um, that's why. We, we got together um, some two years ago and it was, it was a bit of a funny story. So he, he took me for a coffee and we, we obviously knew each other. Um, we went to Starbucks and I remember he, he sat in front of me and he had this business plan. And, and when I say a business plan, this thing was a hundred pages long wow. and it was the most detailed thought out business plan I've ever 
had put in front of me and I just I just went I was sort of taken back and he just said he just looked me in the eyes and said you you back me now and I'll, I'll put you in Forbes one day and I said and I said wow you know like and you know I had I had the company already set up it was going it was going well but it wasn't it wasn't where it it was cer- certainly nowhere near the potential and and I said you know what I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna back him here. Um, I'm gonna take a chance, and um, yeah, we started, and and sure enough, about three months ago, we were actually um, published in Forbes Australia. So, oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, he he came through with his promise. So that was that was pretty wild. Never never in my wildest dreams would I would I imagine um, that we we you know the business would take off like it did, and and for for Dan and myself, we're so we're so different. You know, he's commercial and I'm operational, and together. You know, mate, we're unstoppable. You know, it's 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 such a good it's such a good balance with the both of us. It really works. So, what are some of those? I mean, there's so many things to unpack here, and hopefully, we get to some of them in this episode. Uh, if there is anything uh, uh, that we do miss out for you guys out there watching this or listening to this, like let us know, um, and maybe I can coax James back on to answer some of those questions. But um, I'm curious, like, what that look like like you mentioned you were the guy out there throwing in papers you know on, on the fulfillment side like what's that journey been like for you now where you're sort of not doing that mate like uh, look i i don't mind getting out on the tools um from time to time and you know show the boys that i can still do it but yeah. the the journey has has been you know i i i have learned so much you know when i started the business i i can tr- I can truly admit that I didn't even know what what a bass bill was or or how to pay my taxes. I just I I can I can lay asphalt, um, but I didn't know that side of of the business. So I I taught myself. Um, you know, me and my wife, um, um, she used to do the book work, and we we literally. You know, we we sat on on our on our software program. We used to um, use a program called Invoice to Go, which is oh, probably one of the one of the worst programs out there. And we thought, you know, yeah, we're, yeah, we we know what we're doing. And then no, we we didn't know what we were doing yeah. at all. But but no, over the years, um, just transitioning from on the tools to in the office has been been such a big difference for me because this is this is not really my space, but. Um, I, I had to learn it. I, I was forced to. You know, that's that's a massive part of business. Um, yeah, I know that's <clears throat> one thing as business owners, you're constantly having to take one hat off and put another one on. Hundred percent. Like as a tra- as a former trainer myself, I knew that was like like you. I used to love getting out there, and I used to love digging holes, and I used to love doing all the you know plumbing stuff. Like yeah, a finished job and going, look what I've done, and then all of a sudden you're in here like managing HR and you know yeah yeah. Like what? How did I get here? But yeah, I, I think it is an important, uh, and, and, a lot, and a lot of businesses trip up on that, you know. And and there's that there's a whole sort of thing around, you know, I've got to get off the tools, got to get off the tools, got to get off the tools. And mm. a lot, of, a lot of our clients and you know listeners and viewers out there, especially when you've been through a trade, you're good at the trade, you're good at doing the thing. I think there's sometimes this, it's almost like a forced pressure to say you have to stop doing all that stuff and start doing mm. this stuff. And in yep. my experience, I've found that it's often a case with these guys where you don't necessarily have to do that. You've just got to find somebody that can do those other things. Like That's right, lot, yeah. In a lot of cases, and I guess this is probably a testament to you now being sort of in that operational department where you sort of found your sweet spot there in managing the things that you know, like you're good at that. That's your, you know, your mm. wheelhouse. Um, maybe you, you're not going to be the guy to do your accounts reconciling, but you have yeah. people to do that, right? Of, I, of course. I think for like a lot of guys out there, when you end up in that uh, scale side of your business, it's important to understand where your strengths lie and mm. then what you need to do in order to, uh, I suppose, supplement that, who you need to find that can fill in those blanks. So I'm curious, like for you guys, what did that journey actually look like and how did you and Dan define, okay, this is where we're going to sit on the organizational chart. These are yeah. I and mean, then this is how we're going to find team members to complement what we don't know very well yeah 100 percent. you 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 couldn't have said it any better you um you know that the skills that i had were were in one one department and uh, you know i always say um you surround yourself with people who are better than you as you know is a bit of a saying so uh, you, you can't you can't be across every avenue perfectly of your business so as you you know dan and i sort of had this um 
had this goal in mind where it's it's sort of just coming to reality now that we we are able to step back um you know we've got we've got business managers business development managers supervisors foremans leading hands you know it pr we've got we've got every base covered you know dan and myself are very much involved we you know i i, I still know what every aspect of my business is doing but I'm not in the trenches anymore, you know. I don't, I don't have the stress of 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 putting all those hats on, you know. That's, this is why we pay our team to do it, and and I think um, complementing that, having a team environment like we do, I, I think we're very different to a lot of places, you know. We don't, we're not, we're not, we, we don't do it, do things normally, um, so to speak. So um, having that team environment, everybody wants to come to work, everybody you know, wants to win. And, you know, our, our boys, our team treat every win like it's their own. You, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's so great. The culture that we've created that they come run upstairs and just go, we've just won this job. Like that, like they're getting paid a million dollars for it. And I love that, you know, they, they care. Yeah. Awesome. So um, how does that look then? Cause you, you and Dan are co, correct me if I'm wrong, co-CEOs. Um, co-founders, co-CEOs. Correct. Okay, so what does that look like in terms of, um, like, in the, on the organisational chart? Who's in charge? How, like, how do you make sure you're not doing the same shit? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's it's actually really easy for for Dan and myself because because we're terrible at each other's jobs, <laughs> but we're so we're so good in our space, you know. So I'm I'm. Um, I'm operations, operationals, you know, I, I will run our staff. I will, I'll run day to day operations. And, um, so Daniel's actually an accountant as well, which, which is, yeah, that helps us so, so, so much. So he's, uh, the commercial side of things, accounts, reconciling everything. And also too, I, I have to mention my wife. She's, she's fantastic. She, she works from home. Um, she does all our payroll and, and things like that. So before, uh, Dan's time, it was, that was her side of things, you know. I, I'd be, I'd be lost if if I had to do the payroll or accounts. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And so, so your wife now, she she sort of manages the is that bookkeeping? Would you say or is yeah, that- and and HR. She's she's um she's quite good at HR as well. So um we we um have a third party um HR team. Um we we use EmploySure as well. So just just going to that next level, it was part of the you know, prerequisite, we had to have an external HR. Um, but yeah, but up leading up to that, um, Jess was doing that. So, and she was really good at it. That's what, that's, that's her space. So again, circling back to everybody having their roles and being comfortable in those roles is just paramount for, for a functional business, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's not always a, um, it's not always an easy dynamic as well when you have, like a, a lot of a lot of businesses, a lot of trade businesses find uh, that we speak to anyway, and I know because it's definitely certainly been my experience in the past, where you've you know you're, you're running a, a trade business and it starts getting busier and busier and you need help and then you bring your mm. partner in to help with like you know bookkeeping or things like that and yeah. sometimes that's not a comfortable transition. Like all of a sudden, oh here you go, just you go do the books. Like how how, how the hell do I know books? So yeah, yeah, hundred percent. How did Jess roll into that role? Yeah, mate. Honestly, I I couldn't speak any any more highly of her. She, I, I know what you're saying. It's it's very touch and go. You know, does are they suited to that position? Have they ever done that before? And, and the answer is no. You know, Jess was a um, she's a beauty therapist. Um, you know that that's what she knows. So no accounting background, no no prior learning to to business. Like myself, it was we were very self taught. But she she hit the ground running and um and um. Yeah, it was very, very seamless. And then I guess for us, we, her working from home, we've got to separate our, our work home life as well. So we sort of were able to switch on, you know, we've got a, we've got an eight year old son, you know, she, she needs to be a mum and, and I need to be a dad and we need to be, um, you know, husband and wife. So we sort of, uh, as, as hard as it is, you know, went, you know, over the years I've had, I've been on the phone all hours of the night, but, like I say, now we're able to step back and sort of, you know, four or five o'clock in the afternoon when I go home, we can turn off and we can be a family. But um, certainly that is, that's not a thing for, for a lot of years. And I think that's why having a supportive person behind you is, is so, so important because <clears throat> if you don't, 
business is a very selfish game and, and it takes a lot of years to, to not become selfish, so to speak. Um, you know, it takes up all of your time. It takes up all of your money, takes up all of your cash flow. Um, until you, to, till you get to that next stage where you can, where you can step back. And if you make it through that period, then yeah, you're laughing. So how have you guys managed scale? Like how many staff have you guys got now? Uh, we've got about 45, 45 under us now. Yeah. Okay. So how did and you- Plus contractors. Yeah. Sure. Cause that's, I mean, that's a lot of mouths to feed and that's, you know, it's not just 45 problems you've got, it's 45 families worth of problems. So how do you guys manage? <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And that's, you know, that's, that's, um, Dan and I, uh, that's our daily struggle. You know, we've got a, we are responsible, um, for these 45 families. And, you know, we, we take it very personally when our calendar's not, not full and not busy, we don't leave the office. We, we work and work until it's, you know, until we're busy, until we comfortably know that, that our, 45 obligations are, are met you know what i mean it's it's a very it's a scary thing and and look 90 percent of these staff are full-time as well you know we've probably got we've probably got yeah 40 uh full-time staff and five casuals um so yeah it is our 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 weekly and monthly commitments are, are absolutely massive you know our overheads we've we've got to hustle we don't have a choice and how how did you go about finding 45 staff when you're running like is it right to say you're like seemingly local like do you guys operate yeah, yeah, no, we're all all local. We do operate, um, you know, interstate and things like that. But we will send a crew away, so everyone's local. Um, and I guess, look, our probably our biggest hurdle and our biggest challenge over the years has been staff. And I think you know, ninety nine percent of other business owners will agree with that. Um, so we. What we did, you know, we, we were having such a high turnover of staff because, you know, Ashfold is, as, as much as we don't like to admit it, they're very, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm being one myself as well. They're very, very hard to please and very set in their ways, so to speak. So, um, Dan and I came up with this, um, with this slogan and this idea, and that's the, the new asphalt generation. So what we found is our biggest problem, like I said, was our staff retention. We were just getting just, dickheads so to speak come through you know and we you know we think why surely this there's a better way so what we did was we we said right what we're going to do is we're going to bring on a whole heap of these new younger guys who are keen to work you know i i got guys messaging me every couple of days on facebook that say mate i don't have any experience i just i just want to work i just want i've you know i've got a baby on the way or whatever and you know getting those those uh, people like that who are so, I wouldn't say desperate, but so, um, you know, so driven and, and ready to work is, is such a, you know, they're the ones you want. They're your long term staff who've got purpose and who've got drive. And so we bring them on. We spend that little bit of extra time. It takes us a couple of months to train them up. But once we retain those, these new young, young guys, um, we call them greenies, mate, they're, they're fantastic. They, they really are. We got a couple of 17, 18 year old, 19 year old boys who are just absolute weapons. And it reminds me of, you know, the drive I had when I was young. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to be said for like bringing people up in your culture as opposed to bringing people um, into your culture. Mm, you know, yeah. Like, <clears throat> that's, I know a lot of lot of the guys out there, you know, as, as a staff retention strategy, use the apprentice model, you know, within the trades where they'll bring apprentices up, they'll train them their way, and then they'll promote them within, you know, once they're- once Yes, they're, yeah. And it, 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 it's 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 a slower burn, obviously, but I mean, as you've probably experienced, the uh, the churn is a lot less when you've got people that are part of that culture, part of understand the system, understand the way you operate. Hundred so percent. Like when you say you bring these guys on and you and you train them up, like what does that look like? Do you have a defined training program? Like how, yeah, how you- we. We do. So, so usually the leading hands and the foremans and the supervisors, you know, the hierarchy of, of an asphalt crew, they will, um, they will train these guys. And, and what it means is some, some of the older, um, and I'm guilty of it too. Some of the older asphalt guys who, you know, they've got bad habits that they've inherited over, over the, over the years and they, they're very hard to shake. So if we can manipulate these young guys ha- who are keen to have a go and teach them the right way, like you say, a bit of a slow burn. Um, it takes a bit longer. Um, but once we, you know, once we, you know, get them to the way we want them, they usually, 
I usually stay that and we can, you know, train the good habits and then definitely promote within. That's, that's a big thing, um, for us rather than, you know, it's, it's such a kick in the teeth for the boys to, if we need a new leading hand or a foreman to bring someone in externally when, you know, we've got, got we've got loyal guys who have been with us for years who want to step up. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, we've found it's much better to do it that way. One of the things that, um, I learned many years ago from a, a guest and now friend who's been on my podcast, oh, a load of times al al levy who's was the seven power contractor over in the us and his whole framework was i mean he was very much like job based the heating cooling hvac based out of new york city and that kind of stuff but you know from the beginning their whole model was um you know offer people the difference between a, a staff member con continually jumping ship for you know extra few bucks an hour to a competitor mm. is the ability to be able to offer them a career path because Absolutely. And you take the emphasis off, you know, a couple of bucks an hour when they know that there's somewhere that they can be promoted to and they can see there's a career path for them to follow within. 100%. And, and that's been something that we, you know, we do as well within the business. Like it's quite a, it, it's good to be able to have that forecast, that uh, org chart forecast and say, well, this is kind of where I want you to be provided you do these things, you know. And that's um, the... And I like what you said as well about, you know, sometimes when you're bringing people in that have experience, um, you know, you, <laughs> it's sometimes harder to make them unlearn things. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Just learn your way. And I know we've had this conversation so many times with clients over the years where you've got people that just, you know, team members, for example, that have been there forever, part of the furniture kind of thing, and they're so used to doing things their own way. And then mm. you know that comes in or there's like this, you know, the business has had to evolve due to scale or growth or whatever it might be. And, you know, things have to be tightened up mm -hmm. and just like this blatant refusal to do it. Based hundred percent. Don't, I know how to do my job. Don't tell me to. And, you know, we, yeah. we've or, had, or they're too good for, you know, they're too good for those, the, you know, as the business changes, sometimes we need to, you know, we need to do things that we, we, we probably don't like. And, and having that mentality that, oh, you know, I've, I've, I've done my time. I, I don't, you know, I don't have to do that. It doesn't work. You know, you can't, you can't operate like that. You know, I'm myself, I'm, I'm happy to go on a night shift and get on, get on the shovel all night. I, I love it. You know, it's, we've, we've, no one's better than anyone. We're all on the same team here and we, you just got to do what, what's got to be done. Um, yeah, I know that's like a big, a big conversation when it comes to especially like acquisition. And, you know, we've got like some of my colleagues and friends that are very big in the, you know, uh, growth through acquisition model, where essentially they mm. buy businesses, um, yes, and then they then they they grow that business as, to become part of theirs, like an umbrella sort of situation. Yeah, yeah. However, that's very often the case when they when they're acquiring a company and they're building, bringing in sometimes staff that you know are so used to doing things a certain way because they've just been mm. given so much rope over the years, and they're very reluctant to change, which often ends up in them getting punted. Truthfully, hundred um, percent. It's a very common conversation when you're like, okay, this guy, he's been here, he's like been here 25 years. He's the, he is the best at doing the thing, pitching roofs, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. but he's like a cancer when it comes to culture. And like, yeah, as soon as we turn around, he'll just tell people to do things otherwise and he won't follow process and he won't do this and he won't do that. And, yep. and everybody, like so often they've got to go. Yeah. Yeah. No, we see, we see that all the time. And I guess that's, the, you know, again, one of our, one of our biggest challenges over the years is just, just weeding those people out who are not, they're not bad people. They're, they're great at their job. Like you say, fantastic at their job, but they don't. They don't want to go with the times, you know. You just—it's just not like that anymore, you know. It's, you've got to be so versatile, and you can't—you can't be stuck in your ways. There's so, so, so many aspects of the business now, and um, when it's evolving and changing, and and uh, you know, especially with the way society is as well these days, you know, we need to be—we need to be pretty savvy with 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 all of that, you know. And yeah, it it just doesn't work. They're just yeah, it's a bit of a roadblock. So we've we've been. <laughs> consciously weeding them out over the few years and it's just it's just what the way you got to do it with business what do you think's been like on a personal level some of your biggest challenges in you know in growing this business to where it is today so apart from apart from staff um like i said that 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 was one of our biggest but um personally staff do you do you at the end of the day put that down to like a process 
failure in the sense of like we like we need we need to be hiring a better hiring process, a better recruitment process, a better training process, a better retention process. Like yeah. yeah. It's very easy as business owners to sometimes go, oh, I hired this person, they were shit, they're dickheads. Yep. They're yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I, um, in the earlier years, um, just, just touching on that, um, I, I sort of tr- tried to manipulate, um, the, the, the hiring process. And I just, uh, firstly, um, about 12 months in, I started a labor hire sort of subsidiary, um, company to, to platinum tippers. Um, so, you know, I would, um, when, when, you know, other asphalt companies needed, needed blokes quickly, you know, they might have had a massive project and they go, shit, I need, I need six or seven blokes, you know, um, what do we do? We go to a labor hire company and then we get concreters or painters or, you know, that th- right. they're not suited. So, um, I had this idea of, of just, of just doing labor hire, but job specific. So purely skilled asphalters with with a skill matrix of shovel hand rake hand roller paver level you know all all of the above where um it, it sort of started a a dynamic in, in brisbane and it's we still do it now we we cross hire our guys to to other companies when you know when when needed and and they're all asphalters then you're not going to get an unskilled guy who shows up and goes you know oh, i've been painting for 30 years and you go cool can you can you drive a roller can you roll this mat and they go no i can paint <laughs> so so it, it was yeah it was it was pretty cool and and like i say we still do it to the to this day um so keep it, keeping it in house i guess is uh, to answer your question is is a big one and keeping you know um and yeah, keeping trades specific to 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 what people's skills are cuz yeah we we need asphalters that's 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 the business we're in you know what does the recruitment process look like? For us internally, it's it's super easy. So we have a labour hire license. Excuse me. Um, so we, when we hire out um, other people to uh, um, contractors to other companies, it's basically they're covered under our insurance and our license, um, and we basically just hire them out for X amount, make a little bit of cream on top, and 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 vice versa. You know, we'll we'll do that. Um, but what what. Um, is happening nowadays in the, sort of in, in the past 12 months, a lot of guys are going out on their own and, um, you know, getting their ABN, a vehicle and insurance and hiring themselves out. They're, they're all asphalters. Um, and they're all, you know, everyone knows them in the industry. It, it, it works quite well, but what they're finding is when it's really busy, it's great. When you get a full month's work, it's fantastic. When it's not busy, they're going, shit, I've worked, I've had two really good weeks and I'm getting paid well. I haven't worked for the other two weeks. I yeah. could have just I could have just worked for one of the other companies with no stress, you know. Well, I mean that's business, isn't it? Really, correct. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. I don't I don't think it's necessarily specific to your industry, but I, I suppose what I'm asking is when you're building, you know, 45 staff, it's like what does your recruitment process look like to find those people? Yeah. So so basically, a typical recruitment process is, um, and this is where our social media comes in handy, uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate. So we'll put it out to all of our platforms, going, "Hey, we need we need a you know um, truck drivers or, um, or a specific role," and then people will see that they'll apply, they'll come in, fill out all their all their stuff, go out with the crew for a couple of days, and um, where 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 it's new greenies. Um, as we call them, then they will get trained up on our crews and, and then the foremans will make the call if they're, you know, going to make the cut or not. And that's all, um, all physical on-site training. It's not like, um, it is. Yep. Yeah. It's all, all, yep. Yeah, all on-site. So if they're in a, if they're truck drivers, they'll go in a truck. If it's, um, if they're crew workers, they'll go with the crew. It's, it's all done on site and all, you know, we've got plenty of experience in, in our crew. So they'll, the boys will work with, with, with them and, and basically, you know, you, you know, pretty quickly if they're going to, you know, if they're built for it. It's look, it's a, it's a hard industry. It's, um, it's certainly not an easy industry. Um, yeah. And, and heat, you know, middle of summer, we've got long pants, long shirt and 180 degree asphalt coming out of the paper. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty hectic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when you're um like w- is, is it you or dan that sort of looks after the recruitment side of the business or both of you so that that's that's my side of the business yeah that's that's and the, yeah so how do you know how do you forecast at which point in time you're going to need more team like what does that look like so we we try to run pretty pretty heavy um at all times you know beef the crews up because um to 
you know, to just to, to accommodate for the industry, you know, going up and down with, with, you know, businesses, you can always downscale, but, um, upscaling really quickly is, is challenging. So like I say, we, that's what we call it. We, we run heavy. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've got our, uh, a program that we use, um, on our calendar, excuse me. So we know, you know, what's coming up sort of a month in advance. We're sort of booked out for four weeks in advance. So we can, you know, you know, accommodate that. But like I say, with, with these contractors out there and the labor hire stuff, if we, if we know we're going to be really busy, we can book them in advance for say, you know, Hey, I need, I need the three guys for the next month. And it, it's pretty easy like that, so to speak. All right, cool. Uh, what are the other challenges you've had us outside of uh, recruitment team? Um, apart from staff. So um, the industry um, definitely, is is a big challenge you know it's very it's very competitive um and you know when we're quiet like i say you know dan and i take that personally that's when we really really feel the stress and there has been you know there's been quiet times over the years since since covid hit um it's we've been really lucky we're one of the one of the industries that the um you know the 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 local governments throw a lot of money at is is infrastructure so we were lucky enough to work through through covid and and from then on, it really, it really boomed. But before then, it was, it was patchy, um, from month to month, you know. So we, we really had to hustle for our work. It didn't just come, come naturally as it, as it probably does now. So, um, one of the, the most important things that we, that we found for our customers is when it's, when it's quiet, everyone wants, everyone wants to be your best friend, you know. Um, but when it's busy, it's how you treat your customers when it's busy is is how you're going to retain them when it's quiet so when yeah, when things are crazy uh, i know uh, a lot of other companies uh, are probably quick to say you know wow we don't need your work you know it we, we got plenty of work but you need to remember that's not always going to be there yeah. and it yeah, it's very much so how you treat them when when it's busy and so like with that in mind so is the majority of work that you guys do is it is it tender per project or is it like a contract length where you know, we'll take you guys for the next year, kind of thing. Like, how does it so? It, so, it's there's different there's different types of things. So, the truck side of our so so we've basically got um we've broken the company up. We've had a bit of a restructure. And we've got um all these subsidiaries. So, um our cartage component, for example. So we've got we've got six or seven asphalt trucks that just work day and night um out to one of the bigger companies. We don't even use our own trucks because we've got such a good relationship with these these this said company that they just take all our trucks day and night and that's just a truck trucking component of the business that just runs itself it's beautiful and then um and then the the other the other sides of the business is um um is contracting and then uh which is which is our asphalt crews um and then we have um our crew hire so um when we're not doing our own work um, we will actually hire out our, our whole crew to some of the other companies. So, um, it, yeah, it's, it's all about just moving, moving things around and, and trying to keep, you know, keep all aspects running. Do you ever get any animosity with, you know, the people you're hiring team out to based on you kind of also being competitors? Yes, we do. Yeah. So that was one of the, one of the biggest challenges when, was when we, when we got bigger, um, or is you know we we are in direct competition with these other companies um it, look it's all about it's all about how you look at it you know we're we're very respectful we are we are tendering for the same projects um in a lot of ways which is um what you were asking before sorry i just realized i didn't really answer that last question the tendering process um but yeah um we do we do, we are competitors, we are directly competing, but there's enough, you know, there's enough work out there for us to all work together. And, uh, and you know, we get along with some of our, our biggest competitors. We get along really well because we use each other's resources. You know, we, we, we help each other out. If, if you're, you know, if, if you have a, if you're at war with some of the other guys, it's, it just doesn't work. You know, it's, we're going to, we're all going to do it anyway. You know, we're going to do the work anyway. Why, why not? you know, try and get along and, and help each other out. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to be said for that collaboration <clears throat> between, you know, competitors and whatever, like all uh, colleagues, let's call it, because I think typically when that dialogue is good and positive, it means that you don't necessarily fall into that situation so much where you've got people radically undercutting, like you're all kind of pricing mm. it 
you know, within the similar sort of brackets and yeah, you know, it's, it, it's a lot healthier. Yeah. And, and look, when it's busy, like I say, it's great. You know, we'll all, for our, for our bigger projects and our main, oh, can you still hear me? Yeah, mate. Oh, something just, oh, my mic, I thought my mic went off. Yeah, when we're all um, tendering for the same projects and, and it's busy, everyone's happy, you know, it's, it, we're all, we all, you know, it's, it's very visible. We can all see who, who wins the job. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a panel. So you, you go, Oh, you know, we, we, we lost that job and we were, we were 50 grand too dear or whatever. Um, or whatever. And we have a, have a bit of a chuckle about it. But yeah, it's, you're right. When it's, when it's so competitive and there's people knowingly, you know, undercutting and things like that is, is when it can get a bit, you know, a bit tit for tat, which we, which we don't like. That's the culture that we don't want. So when you go, like going back to that previous question about like tender and stuff like that. Um, like the projects, are they are they pro, are they project based tenders? They are, yeah. So they so there's a panel, like I say, with with um you know local governments and things like that, and everyone who's got the uh, appropriate prequal, um, so everyone who's allowed to tender for that will tender for it, and then it's 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 a sort of up to uh, up to the contractor or, or the government who they who they choose to go with, and they try and spread it around. They don't, you know, they don't want to put all all their eggs in one basket as well. Um, because if something, like I say, when, when it gets really busy, some of them go, no, we're not, we're not doing that. And then they're, you know, they're stuck. So they share it around and yeah. Is prequel, is the prequel conversation related to like industry experience or certifications or it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a sort of certification process. So, um, so firstly, you know, you need a minimum of, um, of your ISO, which is, you know, your safety. And, you know, we, we, we go through constant audits all the time, um, to be, it's, it, it, it all, it goes hand in hand when you leave that mum and dad driveway market. So when, when you want to tender for governments, schools, yeah. councils, you know, TMR main roads, it's, it's a whole different world, which is, which is what we've just done. You know, we've just branched into that. Um, they call it A2. So that whole red tape sort of scenario where it's so very heavily like legislated and like, you know, process driven and like kind of stuff. Mm. You have someone that runs that division for the business like what is in yes yep right? yep so our business development manager so he's he's in the office downstairs that's that's him just purely based on on tenders and he will he will literally sit for 10 hours a day in front of his computer just tendering um you, you know Kim, yeah I, I couldn't do it. he's a better man than me <laughs> it's it's not my thing i'd go i'd go mad yeah. um but yeah he we do we absolutely it's a full-time job um you know it's customer relationships, you know, um, and, you know, he'll take, you know, take, take them out to lunch and just, just getting to know some of our customers, we have to work on them for eight months before we get, you know, a, a quote request from them because they, they don't, you know, they've got their current supplier, they're, they're comfortable, they're probably getting a pretty good service, you know, it's, it's easy, it's working, you know, why everyone's so busy, as you know, it, it takes a lot to, you know, to get in there and, and, and yeah, it's just relationship based and, and, and that's where we stand out. You know, you'll, you'll get Dan and myself personally, um, who will, who will speak with them. They know our phones are always on. We'll work with them on their, uh, you know, protect their bottom line and what, what, you know, what they need to, to where they need to be on jobs as well. So we're all, you know, so we can all make our little bit. So you touched on, touched on one thing that I'd like to dive a little bit further into because, you know, the whole, it's pretty common for, uh, you know, I mean, uh, scaling back on a small level, if we even talk about, you say, you know, insert trade that wants to get in with like real estate or whatever. And of course, as you know, they already have their Rolodex of people that are calling. Mm -hmm. And like you say, it could take months and months of working with these, you know, tr trying to get even an, an opportunity quote on a job. Like, mm -hmm. how, how do you, how have you done that? And how do you guys do that creatively? So, look, I, test and just yeah, say, I, you know, saying, can we go? Can we go? Can we go? Can we go? Well, well, that's right. I mean, it, it's it's credibility, and it's um, you, you know, building that, building that, and th and this is why our social media is is quite important too. You know, people, you know, some some people might think it's it's just for show, but it, it does serve a purpose. You know, it's 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 familiarizing our customers with with us. Otherwise, you know, like I say, you, you ring up and they go, well, who are you? What have you done? You know. We don't, we don't know. Uh, it's, it's such a risk. You know, I've got a, I've got a million dollar project here. Why should we take the risk with you guys? So it's, it's definitely credibility and, and, and showing, you know, what we can do that, that really 
instills confidence in them. Um, I mean, probably, would you say that it's unlikely that, you know, a principal contractor that you're working with or working that you want to tender on projects for is going to be following you on Instagram? Yeah, look, they they do. Uh, I I was I didn't think so at first, but they they really uh, LinkedIn LinkedIn's massive. Um, yeah, our presence on LinkedIn that's where a lot of relationships are built, and and yeah, that's that's what I learned from from Dan and my you know our PR team is the importance of that because uh, you know I was the same. I thought you know they're not going to be on TikTok or whatever, but you you would be surprised. We've we've found so many people that we do reach out to, and you go, hey, let's have a coffee. They go. And we followed your story for we we know you you know like it's you're not you're not the stranger so it it really does serve serve a purpose um more more than what i uh, that what i expected anyway <laughs> i think the um the general gist from from my experience and this is one thing that we really be big on with our clients and and one thing i think there's a lot of opportunity for you guys watching and listening to this you know it's in telling your story better and I think social media is such a great way to, to do that, to tell your story. And not because it's like, you know, you're trying to give away all your secret sauce or whatever, but it's more like, okay, how do we humanize our business and how do we showcase our mm. expertise? And, exactly. And that's like a really and, big thing. Like so many businesses just don't do that very well. And ha- and how do we make something boring interesting? You know, like uh, asphalt, it's it's quite boring, really. It's people people have this mis- misconception of roadworks of you know that the old the age old guy standing around with with you know twenty people watching him and just holding up traffic and you know that's a, that's a fair assumption because it, it is frustrating. But there's so much more involved when once you you know once you're on the other side and you see the process of things uh, and how things work, it, it, it makes a lot more sense. And it is, it is quite interesting. So, but yeah, you, you, you're dead right. The story behind it is, is what, what captivates people and instills trust. And, and that's how our relationships start. So how do you, with that in mind, strategize that sort of content and how does it look practically when you deploy that strategy? I mean, I mean, you mentioned before you have a social media team, like, yeah, do they, do they go around recording content like the, the yeah so we've got um so we've got um our pr team so we typically try and post you know two two to three times a week and change it up not everyone wants to see uh, you know us paving a road all the time sure. you know there's 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 um interviews podcasts things like that um behind the scenes stuff that goes into it when we buy new new vehicles or whatever um so uh, my wife was was in charge of the social media but then it, it sort of got too much with what she was doing so we engaged with the um with the pr team and and that was you know enabled us to t- to take it to the next level um of of yeah different and, and all different platforms there's so many different platforms now um that that you can be on and you never know who's watching you know it's um like i say you know it, it, people there's there's 10 different places that we post and you know we have gotten a lot of a lot of calls from our social media as well so yeah it's good good to, good way to get it get our name out there so does that form like part of a monthly strategy for you guys it's like right we've got this project up we want to create content on this this and this or is this more ad hoc so to get out there and pull the camera yes yeah, so, yeah so we'll we'll have um our our pr guys go out and film a couple of um a couple of days a week, you know, night shift, day shift, and it, <clears throat> excuse me, it might not be massive projects. It might be, you know, little little potholes and things like that. Yeah. And um, and we we just thought of um, uh, one thing I'll mention is um, probably about twelve months ago we had um, we had this uh, car park safety program. So what we did was we were we were every day we waste you know uh, up to you know ten ton of asphalt of left left over on jobs. Wow. And um instead of instead of wasting it and, and dumping it and things like that, we thought, what can we do? <clears throat> How can we utilize that while getting our name out there? So we came up with this with this idea to to give back to the community and we used that um wasted asphalt and we, we gave back and filled in potholes that um, you know, at, at gyms, shopping centers, aged care centers, schools, car parks, everything. And it went off. We, you know, we, we posted that and we just had calls and calls and calls because everyone, everyone's got minor, you know, road damage to their car parks and potholes. And it's, right. it's, yeah. So that, that was huge. And then we just had basically a flow con, which is our smaller asphalt truck that uh, the asphalt is actually wound out the back of. We just had a crew doing that every afternoon. So the Bobcat would 
drop the the leftover asphalt in there, and then we'd just have a list of you know places for the boys to go around and fill in some some potholes and stuff. That's awesome. And that, yeah, it was it was awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. So, what are the some of the things I suppose? Like, I mean, well, I feel like I could talk to you for days about this sort of stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, well, what is what is the the future look like for you guys? Uh, like yeah. where, where to from here, kind of thing. <clears throat> so, um, so one of the biggest things that we have in the pipe work um, now is a is a production facility. So, so we've um, so obviously an asphalt plant. So we're going to make our own. So we've purchased a um, purchased a block of land, and we're going through the DA process now. I can't disclose where it is at the moment for competitive reasons, <laughs> um, but yeah, we're going through going through the DA. So that that's pretty exciting. That's that's the next. Well, that's the final stage where we can actually produce the product ourselves ourselves and then and then deliver it and lay it so um is that a strategy to increase productivity to lower costs to yeah yep yeah both so um obviously um we become fully independent now um well not now once we do that so at the moment we're we're at the mercy of of buying um our product from our other competitors which like you say when we're branching into their market is is quite dangerous because they can just go up the price for you guys because because you know we're we're competing for their work. Once we have once we're fully self sufficient, their work like do they do they supply and install? They do, yeah, yep, yeah, they do. Okay. Yeah, the, all of the yeah the, all of the asphalt plants. So you got um you know Brisbane City Council, Borrell, Fulton Hogan, things like that. They all they all have asphalt crews, yes, okay. um, that do their own work. So yeah, we're not just buying the the product. We are competitors. So okay. once we have our own production facility, which should be the the DA is probably about another eight months away. It's a very slow process, and then we will start. Yeah, yeah, and that's just that's just ticking off environmental and things like that, all the <clears throat> all the little stuff. But once we once we have the production facility, you know, we 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 go from a goodwill business to a commodity, sure. and we can we you know we're full 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 tilt. That's so that, a game changer. So that then opens up like the supply chain business as well, right? Where you'd be mm. supplying Asheville competing against some of those bigger names um, yeah 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 correct well everyone without an asphalt plan who's at at our level now um you know we can we can sell x bin to them as well so that um yeah that that um increases our top line revenue it um you know it's it lowers the risk of of you know a production facility because we've got not only are we pulling all of our own product um you know that that as i'm sure you can appreciate there's got to be a certain amount of pull through um for that facility to make money every year so whether that may, might be one hundred thousand ton or two two hundred thousand ton depending on location and and pull through um we're able to use you know we might we might do 50 percent of that on our own and then the other 50 percent comes from our customers that we sell to there must be an insane amount of equipment that you guys need to scale that type of business. Yeah, yeah. We, um, yeah, like I say, our um, our depot <clears throat> is in Narangba. Um, so we've got about two and a half thousand squares there. And, mate, it is chockers. I, I, I feel sorry for the boys. Of an afternoon um, when, you know, day shift's coming back and before night shift goes out, everything's there. It's it's full. We have millions of dollars worth of equipment there. It's, it's pretty crazy. And how do you manage that alone like in terms of machinery equipment uptake upkeep so so we've we've got a maintenance a maintenance guy his name's dave and he is <laughs> he runs around like a headless truck I, I feel for him he's he's brilliant at what he does um but we we've gotten to the stage now where we're going to need to put he's going to need um you know a ta to, right. to help him out so is he like uh, a mechanic kind of thing or is he-, he yeah he is he so he he's responsible for all the servicing um, of our equipment alone, all of all of our trucks have to go over the pits. Um, excuse me, yearly for their inspections. There's there's so much involved, you know. This uh, red joes and and everything like that. Is all that part of the like tying into the certification, you know, criteria that needs to be met when you're yeah when these big projects. Like you've got to have this yep, stuff. You- yeah, we have to have full plant risk assessments for every vehicle, full service history and things like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what Dave's <clears throat> you know job is. Once he does it, then he's got to input like our for for our A two, our our systems have to be 
on point. Everything has to be. Um, and, you know, um, Travis, our business manager, he's, he's all over that. He, he created a lot of those systems. We've got, um, you know, we've got some of our own apps and, and things that we use, all of our, all of our traceability for our customers. Cause it's not like, it's not like back in the day when I started Asphalt, it was, it was, um, there was no paperwork. You just, you just order the mix from the plant and you'd lay it in the ground and you'd get paid. Now, the QA, you know, the quality side of things and the traceability is, is just as important as actually laying, you know, laying the, 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 the stuff. Yeah. So we've got, um, we, we use iPads on, on both crews every day. So, um, you know, there's got to be pre-site inspections. There's got to be, um, a- accountability for every, every ton of mix that goes into that job has to be allocated where exactly where it goes in the job. It's got to be compaction tested. It's just, the the paperwork side of things is unbelievable now. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's – like, would it be fair to say the only way you can really be profitable in that space is by having those systems so clearly defined and, and – yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. It's it, w- without them now, you 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 will never branch out of uh, out of that driveway, mum and dad market. Yeah, you just Absolutely. can't. And and what what part of um, that? Uh, sorry, being uh, sorry, like what part of that is being um, successful? I suppose do you put down to technology, iPads, apps? Yeah, a lot. Uh, <clears throat> look, it's. It can be done the old school way, um, but it, yeah, all of all of that is just so. You know, that's what I mean with with ke- keeping up with the times. You know, that's how it is. A lot of a lot of customers, especially you know the councils and stuff, they they won't accept anything less. You know, it's it's got to be it's it's got to be it's done a certain type of way. Everything's got to be uploaded. Photos have got to be taken of every truck and every load that goes into the job. It's it's quite phenomenal, really. What what's required now. And is that often the case where you'll have, say, somebody engaging you for a project and they have a certain process or project management tool or something that you need to use or were they happy to typically use whatever you yeah. use? Yeah, so so typically the process of, say, <clears throat> onboarding a new client is we'll have to fill out their um subcontractor form so we will we'll read through and you know these could be up to 20 pages long they've got all their t's and c's and things like that and uh, as do we that looks after all that yeah yeah we do yeah yeah um because yeah there's there's little hidden things you know uh things like retentions and things like that that's that's got to be taken into consideration um and yeah 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 i know i've I've done some podcasts on that previously where it's essentially like the whole contract side of it's such so you need someone that knows what they're doing mm. otherwise yeah i mean like i say yeah going out and, and laying the asphalt it's the easy part now it's yeah. it's all the all the behind the scenes stuff um but once you get your head around it, it it's it's fine does your legal team um like negotiate on those contracts yeah so we we've got you know, we've got <clears throat> certain parameters that we will we will do and, and entertain but if if something's sort of out of the ordinary or or seems a bit you know a bit far fetched we 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 won't do it you know uh, you know we're we're fine with you know um no deposits and things like that it's just yeah every everyone has their own little um differences but yeah mostly it's mostly pretty much the same now hmm. interesting well mate look this has been an awesome chat I'm conscious of your time I know we've been talking now for yeah no no to an hour but um yeah, I definitely, uh, it's definitely been a great story. I'd, I'd, where do you, where do you think look like looking forward? Like once you've got the the factory built out, and um, yeah, will, it, will will you end up venturing into state more, or what? What might that look like? Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I think that the the business model is to um, is to do this and then replicate. So we'll, we'll grow from from the production f- facility all the way down, and then we will we'll replicate replicate that elsewhere you know i i can't Dan, dan's the same we, we can't stop we'll end up in jail if we stop <laughs> we just we just it's just in our nature that we we um we have to be doing something you know so i i don't think there's any any end in sight so to speak we just want to we just want to keep hustling cool all right well mate look thank you so much for your time uh, i wish you all the best it's been a great story um yeah yeah Big, big props to you guys. And, um, yeah, if you guys out there, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Um, uh, if you have any questions or if there's anything we didn't cover off on, let us know. And I'll uh, try and coax James back into yeah. uh, back on and answering some of them. But, mate, thanks for nah. Really great chat.
No, mate, happy to happy to come back anytime. I really appreciate you having me me on the show, and it's been it's been good. Like I say, I'm not not great at these these types of things behind the camera and stuff, but it's I'm definitely learning, and, and it's been awesome. You've been great to talk to. Awesome. All right, well, listeners, that is a wrap. New Zealand-based home renovation company, 6,593% ROAS. Sydney-based solar company, 2,700% ROAS. Hunter region-based bathroom renovation company, 5,616% ROAS. Melbourne-based building company, 13,182% return on ad spend. Adelaide-based solar company, 2,881% return on ad spend. Guys, the list goes on and on. If you were a trade-based business and you work with projects like roofing, solar, bathroom renovations, kitchen renovations, anything like that, head across to tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. Book in a conversation. It is game changing.